that uh, some basic things are involved. So one thing is solving this equation for x. That's an important thing in algebraic topology. So y is given when we solve for x. Now, this doesn't have a unique solution. But if you're in a metric situation, if you add the condition that d star x is equal to zero, then if, if you have two solutions, they'll both satisfy this, so the difference will satisfy this, and then the difference will satisfy this side stay the same, so the difference is closed under d, so this would be a harmonic form. So on a compact manifold, the only finite dimensional space of those, so up to fixing finite dimensional parameters, this specifies a unique solution. Or the Euclidean space specifies a unique solution. You know, you put in the right side condition. So, uh, and the way to make it unique is to say uh, x equals d star of something. That means d star of x is zero. It's the adjoint of d relative to the metric. And then that kills the harmonic part. So anyway, so now, how do you solve this equation in an Euclidean space? So there's something called the, so this is something in your reading. Seen this name before, B. O. sub R. Law? Yeah. So, this is the language PD people use. So, but there's a picture which is, uh, so you want to solve for x. So, x at p is going to be given by a picture. The value, this is any differential form. So, this is going to be uh, like a k form. Dxi1 dxi k. Let's say k plus one form. And x is going to be a k form. All right, so we have to get rid of one of the dx's. Uh, get rid of one of the dx's. So one way to get rid of one of the dx's is to contract with a vector at any point. So we're going to take the radial vector field from the point P. Let me make sure I have this. It's not the radial vector field. It's, it's going to be, it's going to have constant modulus at any, at points at a constant distance. But it's not quite a constant distance. Uh, but think of these as numbers giving the length. The integral of these numbers over any sphere is constant. So it should go down like what? If you're in Rn, it should, it'll have to go to infinity the length because, uh, right? So how, how fast does it go to infinity? Yeah, Rn minus one because this, the area goes to zero like r to the n minus one, right? In our area, right? So it has a pretty violent singularity at the origin. Not only is it going to infinity, the directions are spinning around, right? So it has an interesting singularity. And then let's suppose that uh, Let's suppose that uh, something has compact support. Maybe y has compact support. Or y is somehow controlled in infinity. Just so that what I'm going to say now makes sense. Vanish is sufficient path to infinity. Then what you do is you take y and you contract it with this vector.
that will take a k plus 1 form at the point and give you k form. Okay. And then you do that at every point. Change what I said to change what I said to you could track with the unit vector field. Just could track with the unit vector field everywhere. And then you add up these things weighted by the unit spherical measure. Okay? That's what I want to do. I mean, the geometric picture is I'm really thinking of this as a, uh, a chain. It happened to be an infinite chain. But it's a lot of, uh, and they're weighted with a measure. And I want the measure, the measure is the, 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 the angular measure of the sphere. So if I move to this sphere, if I take a, a swatch of these, this measure here and this measure here are the same. Right? So this is like, uh, bunch of lines with even weight, constant weight, right? Um, so they, that means out here, this is a cycle. There's no boundary to this chain out here. And it goes off to infinity and, and sort of suppressing infinity. But then down here, all of these one chains have a boundary, which is that point but there, there's a whole bunch of points weighted by the measure on the sphere, so you've got a unit mass there. So the boundary of this chain, the boundary of this of the chain is the Dirac mass at the origin. So this is a one chain, the boundary is a zero chain, so I can give a measure, right? I'm contracting this chain with uh, my Y. It's like a cap product. I'm just describing geometrically. So take the unit vector field, contract it with y, and then average, and not integrate. And you can think that first average this way, and then first you integrate it over each line, and then you average it over y. So, so Dennis, mm -hmm. so you no longer making it smaller near infinity? Well, I have to say something to make this be well defined. Right. <laughs> there are many things you can say. Okay. Compact support or make it smaller near infinity. 
So near the origin, it's even there's a unit vector, so it should go further away. No, no, no. Everywhere it's a unit vector. This is a fixed object. It's wide. Ah, okay. it's a fixed, this is a fixed object independent of this problem. Okay. I'm going to solve this problem, and I have one of these at every point. So it's really uh, something in the product of the manifold with itself. Right. Okay. It's a biform, and it's like an operator. This is the inverse, this is called the Poincare lemma operator. Right. It's going to be essentially D inverse. Right. right. This is a picture of it. So, yeah. I miss how you obtain the chain. Huh? I missed how you obtain the chain. It's a one chain. It consists of all these radial lines with a weight. I mean, the approximate thing would be, let's be like Archimedes, approximate the circle by an n-gon, right? Then an approximation of this chain would be just take a finite number of lines weighted with 1 over n. And then you understand it, right? And the boundary of that chain is n copies of 1 over n of 1. Right. Now just keep doing it, take the limit. Okay. Okay. No, no problem. Okay. So this, you, mean you see this in books, but you never see this picture. You see a formula for the answer. Theos of Orla. Anyway, when they analyze these formulas, they're called Calderon Zygman operators, then these pictures are important. Understanding the analysis, understanding what the nature of the singularity is, stuff like that. So, so there's really a, a two variable construction here. There's this thing at every point. So there's sort of a T and a Q, you might say. Q is studying this what it's like at each point, and then the P is where it's centered, and this moves all around. Right? So it's like a, a bi object, and it's like a matrix, and you're hitting this uh, Y with that matrix to give you the X. And you know, when you, when, you, when you hit a matrix against a vector, you have to form a sum, right? So that sum is the integral I'm talking about. I integrate over all the Q's of each P. Right? Huh? And each P. Now I do that for each P. Right. So this is like a, a matrix with uncounted many entries. The integral is it's an operator. This is the kernel of an operator. It's called the Calderon Zygmunt operator. It looks like something over, I'll use P and Q. So the N minus 1, and then there's a kernel that depends on P and Q up here. And there's some technical conditions, which I don't even know how to write, that satisfies it. But the main, main condition is that there's a skew symmetry, because this vector points this way here and this way here. There's the skew symmetry. And the famous example of this is, uh, well, you can have any power here. n minus 1, n minus 2, n, n plus 1, uh, but then this thing may not be defined. Uh, in fact, I guess it's not really defined. It's only defined for this, this range here. And if, if you go to dimension 1, then, then the uh, Gives it this skew symmetry. 
and then um, so you know this is this thing that you also heard of I mean, one over x one over y or whatever look for well, let me interchange the roles of x and y can we do that it's hard to do I'll allow that. Uh, that anyway the picture is this right so you're you're, you're adding up contributions and there's sort of an infinite cancellation you know, you know the value here is being taken with a huge weight but you're subtracting the value here times a huge weight so if this thing were smooth across the origin then uh, I mean if you get really small a smooth thing is you know, continuous thing is essentially constant. Right? You can think that this will base this whole infinite thing here will cancel because the integral dx over y is infinite, right on one side. But the, the cancellation, so there's something called the principal value where you integrate down to here and try to take a limit and hope that it cancels. The infinite part cancels, and there's a limit it's called the principal value. Anyway, so that's studied in detail. Now that's when you have an N here. In that case, you barely get a well-defined thing. The function has to have a little bit of regularity, and then these operators are well-defined. So they're famous theorems, like if you're in LP for finite P uh, greater than one, then this is a bounded operator on LP. That's a big, big daddy theorem. Or if you're polar continuous, or if you're CR, for R not an integer, this is a bounded operator. When R is an integer, it's not a bounded operator. But you have to put in the right topology, it's called the Zeeman topology, and then it's a bounded operator. And that seems to apply to all these cases. And then if you have a weaker singularity, so you're at this level, like which we have, what it does is the same consideration, except it's about the derivative. You can do something whose derivative is just as good as what you had if you're in those spaces. So if you're in LP, you can do something which has one derivative in LP. And then here, two derivatives, three derivatives. That's the theory of Paul Brown's Zygmunt operator in n dimensions. You have to have this cube symmetry up here plus some other technical things, which I don't like. Because I know examples when you construct operators like this where those things don't apply. They don't, it's the usual thing, they don't have the, uh, they don't sort of have a natural setup. They have a setup that works perfectly for PDEs and all that, but it has too much. Because you're in Euclidean space, it has the luxury of smoothness. Anyway, it's another right hand. There's a famous operator in topology called the signature operator, which can be defined. And it, does, and it has all the right properties, but it doesn't satisfy the conditions. What? You mean D plus D star? Yeah. But you have to define the kernel. So this formula produces something that has, so the x will come out of this formula. So I'll, I'll do this to y and integrate. So I'm basically contracting at each point this one chain against y. And that gives me a thing of one lower dimension. So, um, and it has one more degree of smoothness than, than Y had. So, differentiate it once and you get back to Y. Perfect. Okay. All right. So, now this also produces the solution that satisfies this. Produces. Uh, now, in general, let's think more graphically. Let's think of y. Let's think of y as defining a current, a, a chain by quackery duality. Then the degree here is the co-dimension. So the co-dimension is going down for x. So the dimension is going up. So you can think of this is y, and this is x. Bag on y. You know, and you can actually make this precise by putting in a lot of copies of, make a kind of foliation, smear it out, 
and put a lot of bags here. And then this will actually be a picture of this as a different form. And you can actually move between the two pictures continuously. And so this another way to say this cannot, this is the solution to this problem that has minimal norm and square integral norm. This is the this, this this solution is also characterized by being the exercise of minimal L2 norm. So it's kind of like a minimal surface on this thing. So that's, 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 so it's unique. So it's spread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's just so the Hodge decomposition is a Yeah, of course. Douglas, right? Can you ask where the Chair of Justice is, everybody? She got the first Fields Medal in 1936, solved Plateau's problem. Harrison was a yeah. Great. He taught, he taught, uh, he was kind of crazy though, right? Uh, depressed. Ah, okay, depressed. was it his fault? It wasn't his fault. He was angry with Gauss. Well, he thought Gauss was giving too much credit. <laughs> I won't tell you the stories. They go on for too long. <laughs> Sounds interesting. <laughs> I can tell you if you're interested, but not okay, in too much. Do, do it at lunch. I'll do it at lunch. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is the Bios of Orla. Now, uh, if you want to do this on a torus, <clears throat> you think of the torus as. Uh, Euclidean space, and then you, if you want to, if you want to do this at a point of the torus, you actually have to take all of its mirror images, and you have to. I, mean, I could do a finite number of these, right? And uh, and now you you have to take an infinite number. Is that a name for this? Called Kelvin's method of images or something? Yes. Huh? What is it yes, called? That's what it's called. The method of images. Huh? Method of images. Method of images. Yeah. So, so you solve certain problems by putting the sources in a periodic way, and then you'll get a periodic. You stick in a periodic answer. It won't vanish to infinity now, so you have to think about this. Uh, that's where the. See, here we didn't have to put in any homology condition on the Y. In order to make this converge and work, Y has to be, the necessary condition is that dy is equal to zero. That's a necessary condition. I don't know where that comes in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. If you just, you can, you can apply this procedure to anything, but when you compute what the boundary of this procedure is, there are two terms. And one of them is zero if the boundary of y is zero. And then you get this equation. It's like a chain homotopy has two terms in it. This is like a chain homotopy. Now this is intuitively taking the diagonal, this point, you have every point, you take the diagonal cycle and you're making a homology to make it disappear, pushing it off to the In Rn cross Rn, you have a diagonal. Think of that as an infinite cycle of dimension n. And you need n plus one cycle chain to push it off to infinity. So you just let it switch. You break it into a zillion pieces and send each piece radially out to infinity in all the different directions. That's a, and that gives you kind of a chain homotopy. When you write out the formula, you have two terms. And then dy is zero, you just get the one term. Anyway, if you want to do it in a periodic setting, you have to make this operator periodic, and then you have to worry about things converging, and then you're going to need more conditions. You're going to need that the integral of y over all the cycles of the torus are zero. And that will help make this procedure not be infinite. If there's any kind of flow or something, in some direction, you'll have too many terms and it will be infinite. So the homology conditions come in to make this finite, the method of images. You don't have it here because putting boundaries.
economic conditions. Best, best. This is already pretty interesting. Just understand this, actually. Huh? Your second condition, doesn't that imply that Y is in the image of D? Yeah. Yeah, that's... That's what you're saying. This is yeah. the Durant theorem, right? This, this plus this implies you can solve this. I'm giving an explicit formula in the case of the Taurus thing. picture due to Kolmogorov. It's like the very famous paper called K41. This is K41 A, B, and C. This one has something a little bit wrong in here, but it's corrected later. But the conclusion. So, so this fluid motion is a nonlinear equation. So yeah, time derivative of say the ball, the state of the fluid as expressed by the velocity field, say, uh, is given by some nonlinear term and there's a friction term which is linear. And uh, so the nonlinear term, so you can imagine you stick a Fourier series into this, a finite Fourier series, and just stick it in and have a small time interval and you say <coughs> you advance the time by the right hand side. You advance your time by the right hand side, right? You put it in. If you put in on the linear term here, if you cut your Fourier series off, like in three space, you have three kinds of Fourier series or something. Mm -hmm. uh, then this linear term will just hit, it will be Laplacian, it will just hit each mo harmonic and just multiply it like differentiate uh, e to di and theta, you just twice you get n squared, minus n squared, because you have i coming down twice, and e to di and theta times i, and, then, and again e to di and theta times i, so you get minus n squared. So Laplacian has negative eigenvalues. Mapitin is always writing a positive version of that. It's like d, d star plus d star d, which is hard. Ask somebody to write down the Laplacian and tell who he is. From <laughs> which one he writes. So, oh yeah, so so what happens, the linear term just takes the same finite Fourier series and makes the frequencies much bigger. It makes the coefficients bigger. Uh, but there's, there's actually, um, a minus sign in front of this and a coefficient of friction. So in fact, this is actually going to help eventually. But then the nonlinear term takes the 100 length foot thing and squares it, so differentiates it, one, and then takes it and the differential of it. Well, they'll, be, they'll both be at length 100 because the derivative will again be like one derivative. And you multiply it together. Now you have something at length 200. And you've also put these ends in to be differentiated. So you kind of you think of the energy as being the sum of the squares and coefficients. You kind of push the energy out. Right? So K41 is a paper saying that uh, if you imagine this equation when a certain parameter called the Reynolds number is very large, it's very agitated motion. And the picture is that there's a certain draw it like this, but what it means is the, if this is like, I don't know what it means. No, I'll, I'll draw it like this. This is time involved. This is where the energy is located. 
the energy is located between the zero mode and the low modes. That's what it means to be something to be smooth, that most of this Fourier series is in the low modes, and it tails off. But then, as it progresses, the energy moves, so the energy doesn't, well, the friction actually decreases the energy, but you could be stirring it at the same time, putting in energy. But anyway, it moves down to high, it moves out to higher and higher mode, so it gets more and more less smooth, more and more rough. And he actually gave a specific rate, k to the five thirds, I don't know how exactly how to interpret it. Just from pure thought, he deduces in a one page paper. So as time, time uh, moves? About how fast it moves down. But not completely, it gets out to some scale where the viscosity coefficient, the friction coefficient, starts to be important. You know? that, that would help them, right? Yeah, so what happens is it's more and more fluctuating, and getting, part is getting wilder and wilder, and then, uh, you know, then, then finally the morning comes or something. You know? mm -hmm. and the friction comes in and sort of calms them down. So the energy runs out like that. So that's one effect. That's called the K41 effect. The nonlinearity interacts with the friction. So this Reynolds number is getting bigger and bigger. And so there's an idea that has this Reynolds number, which is measuring the, uh, the violence of the motion, goes to infinity. It kind of converges to, in some sense, in some sense, but this is not known to what sense it is, but there's some features that seem to converge to the, the equation without the friction term. That's called Euler's equation. So some features of Euler's equation. Now, funny thing about this is, mathematically, these equations are not known to have solutions. So they're talking about the observed fluid, and the things that they observe, and the things that they can simulate. So, so this was studied a lot, mostly by experiments, until the 90s, early 90s, was just when enough computational uh, power was readily available to so actually do simulations. And so, and so then these theories could be tested. Dennis, and they work pretty well. Huh? Without, uh, without the friction, is there any hope that the solutions would be not terminal over long periods of time? I mean, it seems like there's nothing that's helping over long periods of time that the turbulence to, to die down. No, I think, um, no, I mean, if you had a steady state solution or something, like nothing would happen. Yeah. But I think the feeling is, uh, well, there's a difference between 2D and 3D. Creation discovered a reverse cascade in 2D. And you can see that. Um, you can see little vortices. And when vortices are the same, the vortices, it's like boys and girls. The vortices uh, come together with opposite sign. They, they sort of go off holding hands together. But if they have the same sign, I may have this back. They have the same sign, they combine into a bigger vortex. You can draw a picture and figure it out. I always forget. And so there's some accumulation of fine structure into coarser structures, which is sort of like going back up here. So there are two things going on. This one's going on, and this one's also going on. This was discovered by, this is Kolmogorov. So he, he worked on other things. Uh, I saw him in the 1970s, and he was still alive then, at the Nice conference. And this stuff was being studied quite extensively in the 50s and 60s and 40s and 30s. I mean, so, but he left this uh, mostly. So he returned at some point in the 70s. 
other authors. And the other guy, we'll start with K. He's the one who discovered this reverse cascade in dimension two. And then he could get brands and stuff because this 2D stuff is used for weather and the, the, the uh, magnetic and the flux in the earth, geophysics, uh, you get what they call the plasma on the earth, mantle, 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 uh, 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 mantle. And they're very similar equations for that. There's, I forgot what it's called, magnetohydrodynamics or something. There are two fields that behave like two fields that exist here, but which are coupled. They're, they're like father, father and son or something like that. Here they're kind of more independent, but they're similar. Anyway. Uh, so, now there actually is a mathematical theory in dimension 2D for this fluid motion equation and show that, you know, quite general initial conditions lead to unique solutions for all time. Nevertheless, it's hard to compute the solutions because they do get very finicky, very fast. They lose regularity. But Theory is powerful enough to control, uh, the equation is powerful enough to allow this very rough regularity. You control the energy of the what? You control the energy of the velocity field. That would be you control the energy of the velocity vector field. It's more than the energy. It's also the. You have. I'll, I'll maybe I'll mention what you have a, a, another control on the first derivative. Well, um, well, so now I want to say something about today's seminar. So if you're modeling something like this, I mean, you could try to have an exact formula, but I mean, like in 2D, here we have the proof that there is a formula, but we can't know the formula. There's going to be a formula that keeps getting more and more fluctuations in it. So it's not going to be that no, not going to be that easy. Uh, and in 3D, we don't even know there is existence. You know, okay? So on the other hand, you know, Leonardo da Vinci drew, drew pictures of fluids with or, you know turbulence and stuff. And we all know that we have this. This this equation is just based on you kind of imagine that you have conservation of mass and conservation of momentum, and you imagine that even though things are going in all these different directions, there's a kind of average flow. And then you write this equation. Assume thermo thermalizing, it's called thermodynamic equilibrium, sort of this average effect, and then this is all PE. So you know, the fluid is there, what the equation has to do with it is not clear. It could be naive, like a PDE person says, does it have a solution? I mean, I'm calling that naive now because this has been studied for a hundred years with a lot of technique and no, no one's cracked the PDE in 3D. Uh, but then you could say, well, let's just make measurements of the fluid and then, and then try to deduce what these measurements would be from the equation without actually assuming there's a solution. So you can put in, you can, so you can measure things like, um, you know, you have a probe somewhere and you just, like the stock market, you measure the price of uh, Google or something every day. You measure the wind at some on top of the Empire State Building every day. You have something printing out the thing. And they do this in wind tunnels. They, they have uh, something measuring every second or every millisecond the velocity and put wind through there real fast. And then they, they just get grass like this. 
and then if they uh, compare this graph to they started one minute later the next day, it would be, I mean, in detail, they're not the same at all, but in statistical distribution and so on, they're exactly the same. So, I mean, the definite structure there. I mean, there's peaks and there's intermittency in spaces between peaks and there's structure. But it's not the naive structure of there's a solution and it's smooth. Or so you say, well, okay, I'll just measure like the average in this time interval and, or I don't know, I'll do something, you know, make various measurements. Okay. So, this is all described nicely in this book. Yeah, I was at a conference all week at Stony Brook, and there was, uh, it was about the kind of pros prospects for fundamental <coughs> physics. So they had, you know, this elementary particle theory and string theory, that's this <coughs> other side. Of, and then they had cosmologists there. Because the energies are involved to make string theory uh, Germain to the other things you're studying are much higher than we could produce on Earth or with any amount of money in national budget all the to that. But in this, you know, the universe, Big Bang and all that, there's energy levels that are sufficient so string theory could be the model. And then there were all these talks about that. Now, the problem is, you know, even though we have a lot of observation and a lot of instrumentation and we can deal with lots of data, you know, we're only looking out so far, only have a small, relatively small piece, we measure things in the past by lack of background radiation, and we're piecing together, and it's very dicey. You know, billion dollar projects are still very dicey. And, I would, and it, it sort of occurred to me, so they have, and they can do simulation too. They can pick models, Schwarzschild model, they can do simulation, compare it to data, but there's only so much data and only so many situations and what models are going to choose. And seeing how it fits with certain theory and something like that. It's, it's very meager. I was thinking, they're missing a great opportunity, this stuff, because this has all that. You can do simulation and you can make observations and you can actually do experiments. See, you cannot do experiments in cosmology. You can't create a black hole. Right? Who's going to create a black hole for you? you know? uh, but here you can create anything you want. You know? So it's like, it has the same, you see all the swirls and turbulence out in the atmosphere. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like, Not really a physicist, but anyway, something wrong. If they just think about science, there's something wrong with their methodology. But there are other places where this stuff is studied from the defense department. You get the point? You can do experiments here and simulation and make observations here easily. Huge amount of data. Many of the phenomena are similar to cosmology. Of course, maybe the energy levels are not quite sufficient to invoke, have to invoke strength. I'm not sure. Okay. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah, right. So, getting down to, yeah. yeah. So, you want to, so you can, instead of trying to solve this exactly and compute things from formulas, which Possible. As, as yet, we don't even know if things exist. And even in this case, when they do exist, you can't do anything that way. You actually want to take, get partial information, measure things, and uh, make models that would, given the initial conditions, 
you measure certain things about the initial conditions, and you put them into your model, and your model cranks out the prediction and the answer. That's what modeling theory is about in every domain. Whether or not you have an equation like the stock market, you know, hedge funds that have models, they have some information, they're just parameters and during the night to compute, and then when the market opens, they start buying. Does the market run 24 hours now with these computers, or must turn off, right? Huh? It turns off. You know, it turns open around the world, though. Huh? Around, around the world, it must open. So. It's always open somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so there are sets of the different markets. Huh? In, in the 2D case, you had said once uh, that the Euler equation is equivalent to the Beltrami equation. Oh, no, the mathematics. <laughs> the mathematics. The technique. The muscle you use for one is the same muscle you use for the other. So you have to build some interval operator that, to, that you get yeah, a to solve solutions. Do the analysis of like these extreme cases of the Calderon Zygmunt I didn't mention when you have the limit of uh, the L1 and L infinity. L infinity goes through special space and L1 called DMO. You couldn't employ that technique in the, what? You can't employ that technique in the, well, because there's something different in the algebra. I mean, all, all of these equations that live in space-time, they kind of have a structure that depends on the nature of the dimension of the four. There are four kinds of dimensions, right, depending on certain symmetries. So anyway, we want to make models. Uh, so that's what people do. And then, and then the basic problem is this, that like you're going to replace your fields. I'm not even going to write the equation. I may write it. In a, you can happily through so I probably write it. Anyway. But, yeah, because that's why I did the fields for more laws. Important element of the equation. Uh, uh, so you uh, so you can measure things. You can. You know, measure the fluid at a certain time, and then measure it later, and then see whether your model applied to this measurement here produces something at a later time than what you observe. Okay. Um, and then, where do you get these models? Well, you the things you're measuring are like averages over some. You break space up into pieces. You average over little pieces. If you think of, I'm assigning a number there, which would be the average, potential average over, and then I can measure that, or I can just do the abstracted, this is the average, this is the average, this is the average, let time go, and then this is the new average, this is the new average, the new average, and I can take an experiment. That, uh, and now, since this is a nonlinear equation, you have this basic problem that the average of the product is not the product of the averages. So it's an error term. And then you can D. Hoff wrote down this, took equations like this and put in all the averages and all the averages of the products, or all products of the, of the moments, and then found an infinite system of equations for their time evolution. But the way the kth moment evolves in time depends on the kthless first moment. And the way it evolves in time depends on the kthless second moment. The equations are going down like that. And then what this creation various people often said, well now, if we put in this traditionally random data, at this point everything would look Gaussian, say, maybe. And then the way the moments of the Gaussian behave are known, so you can close the equations. So that's called a closure problem. But creation was the uh, big guy had trying to tell you closure. One closure they were using was uh, at the beginning was logically inconsistent because it produced negative probabilities. It didn't, it didn't respect the uh, the statistics of averages and moments. And the, he's the first one to realize that and corrected it. And they assumed that it was Gaussian at some level by well, the central they, there are all kinds of assumptions. You can make assumptions based on physical intuition. It was a very natural one that they did. It wasn't consistent. It's not based on sampling theory, or what? It's not based on sampling and central limit theory, or is it? No, it's you. You, I mean, you want to make a model, so 
you want to, well, if, if it's an infinite sequence of equations, then you have to stop somewhere. So it would be nice if the subsequent things were somehow determined formulaically from the ones up to some point. That's called closure. Try to figure out some way to do that. Well, what's if it's Gaussian, if it becomes Gaussian, then you can do that. But is, what, is the, what is the good reason that it should be Gaussian at some stage? Just random. Things are random. Yeah, the central limit. Central limit. Central That's central what I'm asking. Central yeah. Central independence. Okay. But there are other things that can be used for closure, like some intuition about It's a whole subject. Okay, so now what the seminar today is going to be about is, is to uh, try to add the idea, idea of algebraic topology and homology to uh, the story. So, see, one thing that's kind of One thing that's, uh, in fact, this is one of the ideas, this is Michael Friedman's idea of making quantum computers. One of the ideas is that I mean, there's some errors, I don't know why, but there's something about building a quantum computer about keeping the states controlled. The uncertainty principle creates some problem. You know, error bars get bigger really fast. It's very hard to keep meaningful information. Um, something like that. So he uh, had the idea that you, well, you try to measure things like that have some meaning, topological meaning, like you're looking at some curve that's produced by the by some quantum material, like a border or something, and there's some holes. And how many holes does this curve go around? And which holes does it go around? It has a winding number around each hole. And if you just sort of randomly go in and change everything a little bit, you, you won't change this gross, robust quantity. Because it'll still go, you know, you have to change it quite a bit to make it change the winding numbers. Right? Well, that's, there's a robustness. So there's an idea here, too, that uh, we'll compute something, we'll compute an observable or an expectation of an observable that has homological meaning, and that will be more robust. Not for that reason so much, but it conceptually it'd be more robust. We know we can change our algorithm by a homotopy, say, and that won't change the homology class, and so the computation will stay the same. So then we can set up the homological computation at the level of the Durham complex. Maybe we, you know, maybe we like. I like to think that we take three space and we uh, divide it into little cubes and we cut out the one skeleton. Okay, that creates a nice big fundamental group. And then fluid particles, when the probability of zero, will hit this one skeleton. And then they'll wind through various. They'll leave. They'll enter each room and leave through a wall. And then in the next room, they leave through some wall randomly. So you get this interesting symbolic sequence, and you can do statistics on that and do it for a large time. And that would be some measurement you can make, and it feels kind of humble. You can do this with intervals, these iterated intervals. And uh, it has a homo it has a nonlinear homology, but it has a homotopical flavor. Okay. So things like that you can imagine. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about, right? But now, how do we formalize it? So, so here we have, we're going to put in, first, we're going to imagine above this thing the continuum model, the Durov complex, which we can't compute. And we can't compute, even though I said all this stuff here, I don't know, we can't actually compute this. You have to do some approximation to compute it. <coughs> can't actually compute this. This is the like, whole formula. Like that picture. Yeah, like this picture here, right? Do some approximation. So, but we, but the continuum has a beautiful algebra. So we'll sort of try to conceptualize some homological observation using a beautiful algebra. Then we'll 
actually go in here and break things up into finite things and convert this into some, like, it would probably say a cellular approximation picture or five sides of say grid picture, it's on a grid or triangulation. And then the nonlinear structure should be somehow carried into here. Now we have techniques for that called infinity algebras. Bring in multiplications, D brackets, and bring that in here. And that and then if we said, well, you know what? A lot of this data was uh, not anything was happening here, and actually a lot of it was happening over here. So I'm going to put a lot of, I'm going to change my way I want to compute. Then I'll move the whole algorithm on the previous one homotopically, conceptually, over to the <coughs> new algorithm. And then I'll want the algorithm to still compute the same thing. So now, what is it going to compute? So, so can, I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. What's the role of Poincaré duality when moving to finite things? I wish I knew completely. But, but you know, like in this equation here, it has the star operator and stuff. It's got Poincaré duality, so it could be the. It depends on the problem. It may not have the star operator, like Chern Simons type theory doesn't have a metric unit. It's just got D and which. So that's easier. The, the star operator will be in there. You have to formulate the uh, the algebra correctly to be able to do what I'm saying now. So is that the main problem, transferring that star yeah. operator to higher levels? That's the one thing I haven't known for 10 years, but it's getting close actually initially. But anyway, that's for this problem, you need all that. Right. Uh, but, okay, so this is like the, I call this the, let's see, what's the, you call this? I'm going to call this the pre homological model. Pre means it's something from which you can compute homological and homotopical things, but you don't do it yet. I mean, there are many different sorts of things you can do. But I'm not saying which ones I'm doing. But it's pre in the sense that you have the potential to make all those computations. It's this algebraic topology idea. You have, you have a cell decomposition. You can do lots of different things with that. You convert it into algebra, right? All the steam rod stuff. Yeah. So anyway, we're going to deal, try to deal with all these, al these analysis problems by algebra. Algebraic topology algebra. Okay, so now still, this is this could and there could be. I want to sort of write this outside. The continuum version is here, but we're just going to use that to do the conceptual thinking. But then to do it practically, we have to convert the continuum onto one of these things. With all of its required algebraic structure that we needed to discuss whatever we're discussing. Does that mean passing to simplicial code chains? Should yeah, think of it like, like that? that. Exactly, yeah. Or cubicle, or if, if, yeah. I mean, whatever vector fields are here, too. So you have to think about what that means. How about using polynomial forms in the fixed yeah. kind Well, I don't, it's like that, but I don't insist on that because it could be, depending on what you're doing, uh, you have to choose the right thing. So a lot of applied mathematicians are talking about which, how you do this. or something called finite element methods where they can actually go back and take constants here and convert them into smooth things here that kind of fit together, run the equation, and then integrate back. And stuff like that. Uh, all of those attempts are missing the what we understand as the infinity structure. Which the affinity structure doesn't lose the conceptual structure. It's just a, it's a sort of resolved version. So that's what they don't have. So if if we found something that worked, 
I mean, well, by this method, if you found something that worked, you could write it down without knowing that, maybe. Because you would have to mean that a certain finite number of terms actually gave a good approximation of the answer. You might find that anyway. But I don't think they know how to find these higher order corrections. Because they don't, it's not a concept. They, they assume this, they're at the scale of the problem means they subdivided in regions like near the airplane wing, we subdivide like this, away from the airplane wing, of course, subdivision, you know. So there you could use polynomial forms. It depends on how the, the star operator comes in. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you, well, I mean, any given problem you can do, but I'm there's a not different idea here that we will take the algebraic structure that underlies the equation and try to put it find it out. Is the sequence of moments completely different than in the something? They're, they're, they resonate like crazy. But I don't understand. In this one, okay. She doesn't know she moment. does. She doesn't know she understands it, but she does. <laughs> Together we understand something. <laughs> She's hiding. <laughs> Yeah? Um, I seem to remember this experiment where there were two concentric cylinders with fluid in between right. rotating in opposite directions. Right. And as the speed of the rotation increased, the vastest changes that didn't preserve any homology right. seems right. to that lack this. Taylor or something. I forget. Yeah. And eventually you get to cancer sense. Yeah, it's right, right. So how does that fit into this? It seems to define, I mean, this seems to say that things well, are changing I'm, in a nice way. And that seems to say things bifurcate with topology changes dramatically in a very discontinuous way. Or is that not relevant to this discussion? Because well, it seems uh, to not fit. As I said, there's a parameter of, of how, called the Reynolds number, how, right. you know, the low Reynolds number I mean, for example, even in dimension 3D with friction, if you start off with uh, low enough energy, it has long-term existence. It just sort of goes along, it loses energy, it gets mm -hmm. and then goes to sleep. You know, so now you can sort of raise the, so the space a little bit and you get these similar turning and you can create things that happen. If you, that probably has the period doubling bifurcation. And I mean, at least there's a one with convection walls that does. There's a yes, okay. famous yes. experiment uh, by Lisa at Columbia Boston University where he has a, he has a fluid of uh, liquid mercury, actually. And he has a temperature, very slight temperature gradient. And, and then suddenly there's two rolls created by convection. A little higher, and each one splits into two rolls. And then more and more and right, more. Exactly. And then it turns out, this is the one I was talking in the car, period double. Uh, car? Chain. Train. Train. Sorry. You were in a car. It was a car and a train. On the way to the train. And this is, uh, turns out there's a structure of these bifurcations right. happening in a geometric series with a certain ratio. Four point six. This was observed numerically before, about 12 years before, in the late 70s, mm -hmm. no, late, no, maybe less, maybe eight. early 70s, around 70, and then around 80, this experiment was made. And, uh, this thing was observed experimentally, and I, by the way, it was finally proved by Misha Lubitsch, so I proved two-thirds of it. Eight years. <laughs> anyway, uh, because what was amazing about this is there, there was a precise mathematical statement that was true because you could measure it on the computer. They even measured it in the fluid. You know, this thing existed. You know, it was a precise statement. Just had to prove it. Just keep working until you find the proof. So, anyway, that that sort of and that was thought of as being the simplest kind of paradigm of the onset of turbulence. And then at the end, when this infinite bifurcation happened, then after that, the entropy was positive, there was stuff happening, chaos, and all that stuff. 
but it's an infinite dimensional system. So it's just there's only a small number of parameters that are active. It's many, uh, benign factors. It seems like an effective theory. You don't have all the parameters that are playing. Well. Yeah, so you just, in fact, a lot of my students here at CUNY, like John and Jung Hu, they all worked on this. Models of this. Does does turbulence still have the statistical regularity? What does turbulence still have the statistical t regularity? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's what they've observed. Yeah. Okay. They've observed in the wind tunnels. Yeah. Statistical regularity, re yeah. reproducibility. Like Geese was talking about that chaos isn't stuff yeah. circulates. It's it has this statistical. No, it's exactly okay. like that. Uh, plus the feature that there, it may not completely, Gies was talking about something that if you take a measure of it and then average over all time, it actually converges to a fixed thing. Mm -hmm. So, but here there's something else going on. That it's like the stock market changes from decade to decade or something like that, some interbusiness. So that's another, that's quite, that's another phenomenon, apparently. Yes. I just read this in the book. It's got to write. Not that I know it. Huh? Can you relate like, the, the universal constant you're talking about there to when turbulence will occur occurs after that? Yeah. After that. Yeah. Well, it, that it, something happens. Uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a parameter, and then at this point, and then here, you're, here, something starts, and at this point, it goes down by a factor of five, essentially then things double. You go down by another factor of five, and things double again. And another factor of five is 4.6. Now I'm thinking, you know, if that factor had been 30, uh, they couldn't have done anything. Because you have to take the ratio of this to this to see the factor. And then they've already been out of sight. You've only got three decimal places. So, so like, Applied things are completely silly from the math point of view. The actual constants depend on whether you can do something. So it's like luck or taste or smartness or something. It's not just pure thought. If this had been 30, you wouldn't have heard about this. Or 100, you definitely would have heard about it. So let's see, where are we? Okay, so that, that's sort of this, that, that's about the onset, the toy model for the onset of turbulence. It's a phenomenon, and, you know, and that's what uh, this IMS at uh, Stony Brook is about, because it used complex methods to prove this, and then it started to continue this analysis. Anyway. Ah. So now I want to get to the part that I'm afraid I want to say because I don't know how he's going to say it. He might say it in a way that, uh, uh, you know, when you read their papers on this, they're like impossible to understand because you're too mathematical. I told him to go easy. So, so yeah, so here's this pre homological model. Like, where are you going to compute your computations if it's endowed with additional structure? capture the fact that it's a process going on in space-time. So ideas are a manifold, which we'll talk about all the time. And then, and then a particular equation will somehow enter this picture somehow. And, uh, and then there are certain, thi certain things we want to measure. So, so this has a d, a differential, with d squared equals zero. Crucial. It's pre homological, so that's got a D, right? And then you're going to have two things. There's going to be something coming in here. These are going to be, you're going to decide, oh, I want to know the price of Google. It's going to be that one. And I might also want to know the price of something else, like Twitter or Facebook or something. And they might be correlated or something. I don't know. Well, no, actually, <laughs> I, I can't do that one because I don't know, I don't know what the structure of the dynamics of the stock market is, but 
at least for fluids, I mean, I, I want to do some measurement, like the velocity at the top of the Empire State Building, or the temperature in Florida or something. Well, Various things that you can measure, yeah? Do you want to correlate the velocity at one point to the velocity no, at the other point? No, later, of course we do. I mean, everything you want to correlate. Yeah. If you're betting on stocks, you want to know if one goes up, the other goes down, you know, you always, always want to know whether the things are independent or whether they're correlated. Yeah, you always want that. In fact, in many theories, that's really all you want, certain key variables and how they're correlated. You, know, you want models for that. So, uh, so these are just going to have names. Let's call it. I'm going to use the notation that I think John will use today. E1, I'm going to do three of them. I'm going to do three things, maybe. I wrote this one as a funny symbol involving these two because there's a nonlinear algebraic structure here. And, and we're going to put zero here. This means the differential is zero. And we're going to want to, and there's going to, we're going to have a map in here which commutes with the differential. And these are going to be the random variables that we want to study. So I'll call this map RV. These are the random variables we want to study. Three of them in this case. And maybe... So that's the, the E's are the random variables? Huh? These E's these are the These are the names of the random variables we want to study. Okay, and, and I've written this to indicate that this is going to be a chain complex, linear combinations of these, but this third random variable is the product of the other two. Or it's written this way. It's not exactly the product, but it's uh, this space is actually a two-dimensional vector space, and then uh, you take the exterior algebra on this two-dimensional vector space. So that has, in degree one, it's got two generators, and in degree two, it has one generator, which you write as e1 by two. That's just, and then, and this has various algebraic structure. It's got a product, a co-product. We've discussed the exterior algebra, it's a double algebra, and lots of structure, right? And it's a very simple one, but, and there's going to be a map in here, it's going to be a chain map. Oh, wait a minute, if this is a chain map and there's zero derivatives here, then I'm going to have, so E1 goes to E1 bar, E2 goes to E2 bar, E1 wedge E2. These are actually just elements of the exterior algebra, they, they don't have to go, this goes to E3 bar. Just, I should call this E3, but it's, it's the other generator in here. Well, the derivative of these is zero, so these are cycles. So this has to go to a cycle. So this, these all have to lie in kernel D. Then this will be a chain map. That's kind of trivial. Then, <coughs> these are going to be like velocity, vorticity, time derivative, you know, something. And they're going to, and then what John has observed is very elegant, is that uh, if he takes what I just said, velocity, vorticity, some things using those words, uh, and he puts an algebraic structure that lives on a space like this over here, which is the natural one, one of the natural ones that we have lying around, that this thing here will satisfy these equations if and only if it satisfies the Euler equation. The Euler equation can be written in very simple form, and so this it's a one-line proof. It's very nice. So one of these setups will, will if you actually, now the problem is we don't have any solutions of this equation. So this is a theoretical thing, but wait. If there were a solution, we could imagine this. And then there's certain things we want to compute, like we want to just call this map E, the expectation that we want to compute, say, the, uh, uh, the third moment of the velocity on top of the Empire State Building. Okay, something like that, or entrance to the graduate center. So as you go out, you don't get blown away. 
you know, the thing is like this, you know, you sort of want to know when, when these things are high. You know, whether you pull your hat or not. Kind of thing like so, so this is going to go into, um, this is the expected values. And this is going to be some similar thing with, again, the zero differential. And this is going to have to be, and this is going to be a chain map, again. And so, what's this going to say? So if we take an element x, and we apply dx, if x goes over here to x bar, here there's no differential, so this goes to zero. So dx has to go to zero. It's going to be a chain map. So this, E has to annihilate the image of D. Okay? So then you have the image of this has to lie in the kernel of D, and the expectation value is what you want to compute. These are the things you want to know about. These are the things you, about which you want to know. So they have kind of a dual relationship. These have to be cycles in this algebraic cycle, and these have to be some functions here which uh, kill the boundaries. Why did x bar have to go to zero? What? Why did x bar have to differentiate to zero in the expectation? Why did x bar have to differentiate to zero in the expectation space? It has to go to zero because it's a chain map. Yeah, but why? But that's based on huh? zero. No, oh, the differential is entirely zero. Yeah. The differential is zero over here. Okay. So the differential is zero here, and the differential is zero over here. Okay. This is all completely trivial, but it's very nice. I'll tell you why. Well, if I just change this mechanism here, and this all moves by homotopy, and if I can move this map, move these cycles by homology, so I have another one out here in different algorithm, but homologically equivalent, and if I could move this expectation to another map, then this composition equals this composition. Okay, equals. Because I have homotopic chain maps between two chain complexes with zero differential. So that means the maps are like the homology periods. They don't change. Okay? So if you homotop this whole picture with all of its structure that is in here, homotop this map, new picture here, homotop this map, new picture here. This composition that starts here and walks out to here and then goes into here is the same map as this picture. Are these things like minimal models? No, no, no. They are what they are. Don't worry about it. Just to, just extract this information I'm telling you. They're not as simple as that. You always want to rush to the Where's the infinity structure? Yeah, there, yeah, these are going to be they're for this equation though, they're not just straightforward infinity structures. They're infinity structures plus. Okay, now here's the dramatic moment, okay? This also applies if it's the continuum. Because that's a big chain complex. This abstract idea was homological, even though we can't compute it. And so we actually had the solution of the Navier Stokes equation here, or the Euler equation, if we had done that, John Plymouth today. And this was the actual expected value over the Empire State mode. If you can express it in a homological way, then this computation will actually compute it. If you homotop this to something that we can start cranking out. Now, it's not as great as that because, in fact, when you transfer this continuum into this finite realm, there's an infinite number of correction terms. However, if the solution exists, this is something that exists. This is a number. So this infinite series has to converge to that number. So 
first of all, it has to converge. I don't know when it converges, but at least. So, and this thing can make sense before you know there is a solution. Because if you move this map, whatever this map is, it's going into the finite thing, it seems you can compute. So you can solve finite dimensional equations and make this computation. And if this thing didn't exist, you're going to get something that behaves in a crazy way. If it does exist, it should converge because it's the same number. It's an infinite formula for the same number. So that's the great point. So it's not like you're hoping it approximates the answer. If there is an answer, it is the answer. Well, that's different from the applied mathematicians. Of course, if convergent, you know, it's sort of like this 5 and this 30. There might be some accidental reason why the formula you have has such slow convergence, you'll never get the answer. There are things like that. People like Riemann are very good at figuring out ways to write formulas that converge super fast. You can get it by hand. So anyway, so but see, the, the idea is very simple, but not so simple because you want this thing here because of the non, whatever the nonlinear structure is to actually solve the nonlinear equation. So now let's go back to the equation. Why is something like this even feasible? So what is the? So this is sort of the nonlinear Stokes equation where well let, let's just discuss these two. Have these two equations, the Nagar Stokes equation. This is, that's, and there are a lot of different features here. There are a lot of different families of equations because depending on how you treat the thermodynamics, thermodynamics has temperature, pressure, uh, a volume, a lot of mass, uh, entropy. So usually you make certain assumptions. Energy. I mean, I'm, 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 I think I'm in a situation uh, where you suppose the the entropy, which is the disorder locally, is not changing anymore. It's reached some kind of maximal disorder. I mean, you you, you see you the PDE people don't think this way, but you know you're modeling something which is really made of a lot of complicated atomic things and you're just measuring some gross bias like it seems to be going this way. The plasma of the continuum doesn't really exist. It's just our ideal mathematization. But still, since it's so beautiful, we can still hope to deduce from it algorithms that compute things. Well, and the Nagar Stokes equation is the equation that I'm thinking about is where the fluid is incompressible, air is not incompressible, but water is basically incompressible. And, um, and then there's friction, the viscosity. You said you've reached some level of entropy. You're, you're, what? You're at some level of entropy. You're not going to go beyond that what? level of disorder. At some level? Of entropy. You're not going to go beyond some level of disorder. Right? Oh, I don't even know what I'm assuming. I'm assuming that you're not in there. It's called isotropic fluids. This is an isentropic, uh, constant entropy, uh, incompressible with friction from this constant. And, and what these, I told you about Como K41, remember that the nonlinearity produces this turbulent effects, but when it gets down to this grain of viscosity, it's, it's sort of controlled. So you get some kind of equilibrium of something. So you can stir it too. Other, you don't stir it, but just buy out. You know that too. Pour your cream in coffee, you watch it for a while. I've been watching this thing for 40 years or more. And after a while, it stops doing anything. Mix is very fast, right? It's really hard to imagine how you could write mathematical formulas that explain mixing cream and coffee. Anyway, it was the Nagar Stokes equation that had a little friction, but as you speed the thing up, it had a lot of energy. The effect of this friction 
it becomes less and less. Um, and then, and then there's the Euler equation, which is this is this has friction and this has a coefficient of viscosity. Do y'all have this expression up here? Slow as molasses in January. <laughs> huh? You have that up here in New York? Huh? I know it, but it's not. You know. It. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you from? Your mother's from the south. <laughs> That's viscosity. So molasses has more viscosity in January. Than, you know, so it's slow. And this is no viscosity, so when water has a little viscosity. Uh, these equations don't exactly go one to the other when you have boundary. So, okay. Stood in the rapids in Brazil, watching, checking this point. In this case here, when there's a little friction in this boundary, the thing stops at the boundary. You can actually see, you can actually stand there and watch. Fluid stops at the boundary. Doesn't slide because the little, you know, molecular uh, inequalities or irregularities, you know, it stops. It can't. That's what our hair is for. It stops the airflow. It keeps us warm. Yeah. And uh, but this one, if you if, when you have boundary, the, you, the the fluid just slides along the boundary. So, and the limit of this to this, you don't get the same boundary conditions. One is zero boundary stays zero, even in the limit. So that's a, that's a thing. And then there's this non-rigorous but very interesting boundary layer theory. There's a layer here where it rapidly changes from zero to sort of moving this way. And, and this distance here is about something like the square root of the viscosity, some, some universal constants. And, and this is a good approximation. It's a whole theory in applied mathematics. And it works pretty well, but it's not mathematically justified as far as I, I've heard, I've read, I don't know. And you actually eventually want to do boundary because vorticity is created at the boundary. Interesting structures are created at the boundary. They come from the infinitely small and become nice things. Like at the end of an airplane wing, there's this vortex being created. That's why they now, you notice the wings now have this. They didn't used to have, if you're old enough, they didn't used to have this. Because you know, a bigger vortex ring is created. Somehow this makes it. And, and far behind the airplane, these two vortex rings actually touch and then they combine according to these rules I was talking about before. You know, this is the very, very interesting structure. See, before I was talking about, ah, oh, God, it's all particle, fractal, statistics and stuff. But there's actually some interesting global structure called the vorticity. So you, eventually you want to have boundary. But since it's so hard, Let's imagine there's no value. Can you actually measure the vorticity? What? Can you actually measure vorticity? It's hard to measure, I've been told. You can see it, though, but it's hard to measure. It's a derivative of velocity. The curl of velocity is vorticity. Um, well, so if we don't have boundary, then these equations do, or in, Inside the region, away from the boundary, these equations kind of can transition from one to the other. And there's this, I've read in this book that I didn't know before that uh, some of the measurements for high Reynolds number, which is near, near turbulence, as, as, well, when, as the Reynolds numbers tend to infinity, it seems to converge to this, things they know about this, this consistency inside, away from the boundary. So we can study it one or the other. Uh, you can hope to prove theorems about this one. You can't really hope, much hope to prove theorems about this. 
Yeah. 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 Unless you formulate new ones. New ones. The ones that they're formulating, like existence and uniqueness of solutions, are not expected to be true for this. And they might well be true for this. The clay problem is about proving either the sufficiently smooth data, da da da, the right formulation, this has solutions, or it does not have solutions. And you get the million dollars either way. Here, if you prove this one has solutions, it's now known that this one having solutions implies this one having solutions, so you get the million dollars. If you prove it doesn't blow up, you don't get anything. Because it's expected to blow up. And that's just, what does that mean? And all that means nothing. So I'm, I'm sort of believing that statistically this one exists for all time. But is it expected to blow up because the viscosity is, what? is it expected to blow up because the viscosity isn't controlling the, the turbulent flow after a Well, yeah, you don't have that. Yeah, the, the hope uh, for this one to converge is the viscosity. Yeah. Now, the hope of understanding it though for me is to study this one where the vorticity has a special role in the equation and it's disguised in this equation. And the vorticity is the attractive geometric feature. So the equation, the Euler equation, first I'll say it in words and then symbols. So first of all, what is the, the equation? The, the, the state of the fluid is to give yourself the velocity field. So I'm going to think of periodic three space. So the periodic velocity field in three space. Okay? Everything's periodic, so everything's compact. And then this, this equation tells you what the time derivative is. And it's a non, you know, it's a nonlinear expression. So I won't write down yet. And then even at Stony Brook and Marston dead now, I think, um, I really uh, proved that in the late 60s, that for small time and smooth initial data, this has solutions. It's a nice smooth ODE sort of thing. So, but at, you know, then it goes and then it might get rougher and then the time of existence might get shorter and it might be a critical time when you don't have a solution anymore. But at every smooth point, there's a little bit of time you can go. But then the thing becomes less and less smooth, it doesn't stay smooth. That's the situation. But let's suppose you had a solution for a time interval. So you would have a uh, motion of this three dimensional torus over itself, a family of diffeomorphisms, depending on time, where the fluid just moves around and it's volume preserving. So it's a path in the space of volume-preserving diffeomorphisms of the three torus. And at every point is a tangent vector, which is, you write that down, that's the Euler equation. Okay. The word statement, well, now there's, uh, you look, I've said this many times in this classroom, but you sort of look at this local diffeomorphism, what does it do? It takes a small piece of fluid, moves it slightly, and it changes its shape, some way, keeps the volume the same, and it might rotate also. So it has the matrix of derivatives of the vector field. The vector field has three functions. This function has three derivatives. So you have a three by three matrix of nine derivatives. That has a symmetric part and a skew symmetric part. The symmetric part tells you the shape of the ellipse, how it's changed, the difference between two positive definite products is the symmetric matrix. One positive definite product and another positive definite product. And that's the symmetric part of the derivative. And then the way it's turning is the infinitesimal rotation given by the skew symmetric part of the derivative. And that's called the vorticity. So that there'll be, through every point, there'll be an axis of rotation. 
and an amount of rotation. Then the fluid will infinitesimally start turning in that way and distort itself, keeping the volume. So that's the, okay. So we have, so we can say in words, the two words are velocity and vorticity. I've never counted, these have the same number of letters. You can tell them more, right? Tokyo and Kyoto are an anagrams of each other. You can't prove the theorem, at least you can <laughs> have some fun with the words. So, now, the vorticity is very natural to think of. You can think of it as a vector field which has length equal to the amount of the turn. But it's a little better to think of it as a two form, whose kernel is this line and whose when you evaluate the two-form on the transversal two-plane, it tells you the amount of turning. Yeah. So the skew symmetric matrix looks like this, right? It's, it's got zeros on the diagonal, and then these are just the minuses. So it's just another vector. But somehow it's a matrix, not a vector. So it's really in wedge two. Another wedge one. So and then if you have, okay, here's the tricky part, actually. Here's one tricky part. If, so if you imagine this flow going along, fluid flow going along, at every point we have a velocity, and at every point we also have this vorticity, vorticity of the velocity, in fact, the derivative, the skew symmetric part of the derivative, of the three by three matrix of derivatives and the components of the velocity. But this we'll think of as a two form. So now, so let's think of having two times. Let me think of this as a picture sort of in space time. Same picture, it was in space, but now it's in space. Oh, maybe I should. Uh, so here's one picture. At every point there's at every point there's a velocity and there's also a vorticity. Okay. Now, this is the time T1. So now maybe it goes and things are moving along. So at the time, and then I have the picture at time T2. This is a picture plus words. So there's a diffeomorphism taking this velocity vorticity field picture to the velocity vorticity field. I mean, there's a diffeomorphism that, well, I have this picture of the fluid, and then there's a diffeomorphism of space, and then there's a new picture. And there's a new velocity and a new vorticity. So the diffeomorphism doesn't carry the velocity to the velocity. It's just at a later time, there's a new picture. But it's, it's you know, the thing moving along, I'm measuring it into the test plane. At time t1, I measure it here, everywhere, with the test plane, and I go on. And then at time t, I measure it into the test plane. <coughs> so these lines are not the diffeomorphism. These are the, uh, the velocity field is, well, the velocity, yeah, the velocity field will tell you, see the, the diffeomorphism goes along, it's, it's a, a non-autonomous OGE, you might say. The velocity field is not fixed, it's not following a given velocity field. The velocity field changes. It's like you, you have a velocity field, you step forward of any control, and then somebody says, turn one degree to the right, and you go like this. And it says, turn three degrees to the right and speed up. the velocity field all over the space to find out what to do next by the Bios of Orlog. we we'll get to that. And why is the Bios of Orlog going to come in? Because what's actually true 
is that you're, the fluid's moving from time T1 to T2, but it's by diffeomorphism. So you can look backwards at time T2, back to what was it like at T1, and you can take this velocity, this vorticity two form as a two form, and you can pull it back as a two form. In the order equation, the words are, a motion of fluids is one such that the vorticity is transported to the vorticity from time T1 to T2 by the inverse transformation. So you already see that that's the statement. The, the vorticity, since you know it's a diffeomorphism, you can think of pushing the vorticity forward. That's not really what you do. You look at the inverse transformation and pull back the vorticity. That's, uh, so that's the word for the other equation. Vorticity is covariant. The fluid, you know, like I say, you stand on a bridge and look at a current going by, you see little swirls in the water, flows going by, the swirls are just sort of moved along with the current. That's the two dimensional thing. And then the symbols are, Now we'll think of the vorticity as uh, a vector field, and the velocity as a vector field. And now we'll write this infinitesimally. Let that T2 be T plus dt, and we'll apply the same thing. We want the infinitesimal transport. Now how does a vector field, well, since it's a vector field now, it's automatically invertible, and infinitesimally. How does the vector field move another vector field? It moves it by the Lie bracket. That's, you know, so that the vector field is an infinitesimal motion. If you have another motion, and you want to move a motion by a motion, you have to <coughs> conjugate. You sort of go forward by the one, so that you're here, you want to know what the new motion is. You back up to where you were, apply that motion, and then map it forward, conjugate. Infinitesimal conjugation is the Lie bracket. V algebra is the infinitesimal action of conjugation. Lee groups of Elia, Lee bracket is zero. So it's going to say uh, the velocity bracket the vorticity, as a now thought of as a vector field, is equal to the vorticity vorticity dot. <coughs> Time derivative of vorticity. So this is this is in equations. Let's put symbols. So let D be the curl operator. Then um, and let X be the velocity field. Like you might want to think of it as a one form. We change it by the metric to a vector field. And there's x is the velocity, d is the curl. So the vorticity, y equals the vorticity, uh, then, then you have y dot equals x bracket y, and y is equal to dx. So this is the other way to write it. But this is the way that if you make an algebraic structure that has a bracket in it, and you write down some cute little things here and get this to be a, a nonlinear map, which is a chain map. Oh, and then um, and then you also have volume preserving. X is like a little extra complication. And it, there's a, a nice operator which is D star. If you write everything in terms of differential forms, this bracket on vector fields can be defined in terms of differential forms. It's the deviation from the adjoint of D being a derivation of the wedge product. So you can write everything in terms of different forms, the bracket is still that bracket. And then this operator here, 
which on one form, see this is a two form, this is a one form, so this sends one to one, and star of the one form is a two form, and then d of it's a three form, so this sends one to three. So this operator, if you, uh, it, um, it's an even operator if you do z2 grading, and then This condition is that if you apply this to x, it'll have one piece in degree three. So this will have a part in degree three plus a part in degree one. Okay? This part is the divergence, and this part is the curl. So this is sort of divergence and curl. So this part is zero. It's volume preserving. And this is the operative, this is the vorticity. So this part is the divergence, this is the vorticity. So this part is the trace of that symmetric matrix. Remember I had this, remember I had that little ellipse. It's the, it's the trace of that symmetric matrix. This is the trace of the matrix, this is the skew symmetric part. Apply this to one form. So this operator is sort of floating around. So this is such a simple, elegant thing. You can imagine you could uh, hook it into some of this algebra. We'll see that today. And then this idea of formulating things this way is called homotopy probability. Not only homotopy probability, probability doesn't have this. You have random variables and expectations. And then this is sort of putting them in a homological context. And then it's sort of interesting because then you, you sort of want to measure things that you can make have homological significance or homotopical significance. And then they'll be robust and meaningful. And you go from the continuum to the finite level in a meaningful way. Instead of just saying, I've got a continuum thing I'll approximate it by a grid without knowing what you're doing. All right. Lunchtime.